How effective is the United Nations at supporting secularist principles? What extra pressures will its Human Rights Council be under as a result of the coronavirus pandemic? And what has the National Secular Society been doing to advance secularist causes before the UN? You're listening to the National Secular Society podcast, hosted by Emma Park. Today I'm joined by Josephine McIntosh to discuss her work representing the NSS at the UN. Josephine is a solicitor in London, specialising in competition law, and a vice president at the NSS and member of the Council. She has represented the Society at the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva since 2012. Josephine, first of all, could you tell us about your recent work for the National Secular Society at the United Nations? Hi, Emma. So for my recent work, so I was representing the NSS at the 43rd Human Rights Council at the UN in Geneva. And in particular, we had submitted written statements and I was there to deliver some oral statements on three main topics. Um, The first was on male circumcision, essentially non-therapeutic genital cutting of uh, boys. This um, ended up not being an oral statement, but we just had the written statement due to some um, admin issues. And then we also, um, I also delivered a statement on caste discrimination in the UK, which was, I think, the third time that we were addressing the council on that topic. And then finally, I delivered a statement under the um, Universal Periodic Review of Italy on clerical child abuse um, in Italy uh, from the Roman Catholic Church. Okay, great. Thank you, Josephine. And just just to be clear, which um, council was it? The the UN yeah. so it's the Count, hu- General Council. It's the, the Human, Human Rights, Rights council. council, and the Human Rights Council is a meeting of a set number of states and also of civil society who um, meet three times a year for three weeks, and they during that time go through a whole agenda of various human rights topics. And there is also in parallel to that a universal periodic review, which is what we talked about, um, which is what we we used to address um, clerical child abuse in Italy under. And that is essentially a review of human rights concerns in various countries. And so every country goes through this voluntary process of having their human rights um, situation assessed essentially by a UN body. And then there is also... um, contributions that can be made from both states and also from civil society, so from NGOs, of which the NSS is one. So Josephine, why is it important, do you think, for the National Secular Society to be represented at the UN? I think it's really important for us as an essentially non-governmental organisation to be able to ensure that uh, the secular principles and values that we're trying to promote within the UK are heard on the international stage and not just um, nationally. So the the, um, Human Rights Council provides for that international platform. But beyond that, it also allows us to um, put pressure domestically in the UK by by showing that the values that we are trying to um, push are essentially values that are often represented in human rights principles that are being upheld by the United Nations. And beyond that, um, we're able to point to ways in which um, secularist principles are also um, not being upheld in other countries. Obviously, the NSS is a is a national organization, but I think we still have a, an important understanding of secularist principles and our an ability essentially to be able to um, check them and to bring them to bear when on on an international stage. So that that is one of the reasons. How did you become involved in this work for the NSS at the UN? Um, so I, said I, was, um, I started off as an intern. I was suggested to um, Roy Brown by Anthony Grayling, AC Grayling, who's a philosopher who'd come to speak at my university. And um, he suggested, given that I had an interest in these kinds of issues um, in human rights, and um, he suggested that I get in touch with Roy Brown, who is somebody who was heading a lot of the initiatives at the UN for various NGOs, um, ranging from humanist NGOs to the National Secular Society, but also Center for Inquiry, which is an American NGO. And so um, I started off as an intern and started working for various NGOs 
under sort of Roy Brown's organization um, at the in Geneva. And then from there um, became permanent representative um, for some of these NGOs as well, um, which meant returning during my holidays to um, Geneva. And also having grown up in Switzerland, so having had that physical link to um, to the country as well helped because it meant that I could do it from home um, when I was visiting my parents. How much support is there for secularist principles in the UN, both in non-governmental organisations and among states represented there? There is support, but support um, from, from, some, from some states, but the difficulty often comes from who is in power in those states. So we have had in, in the past you know, discussions with representatives from, uh, from, from the UK delegation. Um, I'd given a speech, for example, on Saudi Arabia, which was then uh, essentially interrupted by the Saudi ambassador uh, representative and the, the Ireland, I think it was, the UK, the US, France, all of these representatives from these countries kind of spoke up and said, well, you've got to let this person speak. And so there, there's been some, some echoes and we've had people attend side events that we've hosted as well from, from some delegations. I mean, also, I have to say that I haven't, I, I attended the Human Rights Council this time around, which was cut short by the coronavirus. Um, but I haven't attended for a few years um, before that, for essentially three years due to um, being working full time in London. Um, but especially when I was very active between 2012 and 2016, there was a lot of pushback from countries that were belong that belonged to what was what is called the OIC, which is the I think it stands for the Organization of Islamic Conference or something like that. So essentially, it's a group of Islamic countries, um, and also from Russia. And these these delegations were essentially pushing for what they termed traditional values, which often looked to promote family, so-called family values, um, which often goes against secularist principles, which will promote religious interference and religious prominence in in family life and in in political life. And then also other issues such as around gay rights, women's rights. And so there's been some difficulty because that a lot of fault lines are then being created within the Human Rights Council along um, by, by sort of alliances along those kinds of principles. Well, let, let's take some specific examples on that point. Um, so you mentioned one of the issues you were speaking about um, in the 43rd conference was um, male circumcision. Mm -hmm. um, what were your, um, first of all, your main submissions on behalf of the NSS? So essentially for that, we were, in the, on the first hand, trying to raise awareness around the fact that um, there is a lot of discussion around genital cutting for women. And there's been a lot of progress that has been made um, for female genital mutilation. However, there's not much consideration being given also to male circumcision. And traditional, what are maybe seen as cultural values um, often trump um, the rights of the child in circumstances where, as a baby, um, or sometimes a bit uh, older, they might then um, have to undergo a form of genital cutting. And that genital cutting does not have therapeutic reasons for, as to why the, it is needed, and it um, can cause quite a lot of difficulties for the child in later life. But because this is a, a, a very accepted cultural practice globally, We've had um, people provide input on this um, from the US, for example, where it's um, incredibly widespread. Um, questioning it as a practice has become, is quite unknown and also can be quite difficult and, and can get quite a lot of pushback from uh, some religious communities. And so um, our main submission was to address that. I mean, where, where do you see it going, this, this issue? I mean, what's the next stage? Is the UN likely to condemn male circumcision or is, is that I don't um, think the next, an uphill yeah, struggle? I don't think the next stage um, is as easy as the UN sort of responding following us having submitted a written statement on it. It, re it will require lobbying. And so what we're seeing um, in the past is that you'll, you need repetition of lobbying and of trying to find rapporteurs, essentially. So they're the, the, the main UN... Um, uh, sort of people and bodies responsible for addressing specific issues. So, for example, we would then be lobbying the Rapporteur for Children's Rights to try to ensure that this kind of issue is on their radar, given that it's an issue that is not on many people's radar generally. It's probably not on, on their radar either. 
And then beyond that, whenever we return to the Human Rights Council and also um, as part of our work on the um, Committee of the Rights of the Child, which is another UN body, we would then also try to do a coordinated effort in that area. And we've seen, we've been able to do that on other issues as well. So for example, in um, under clerical child abuse. Well, let, let's move to that topic then. Um, so th this is, again, it seems to be a, a long and complicated process. Um, so what stage um, are you at now with the submissions for the NSS? So essentially we do, um, we provide submissions on, um, at, under the Human Rights Council. So we did it this time around under the um, Italy UPR, so the U Universal Periodic Review. Yeah. So we are able to, um, to sort of bring to light the fact that legislation in various countries does not provide adequate protection for children who are victims of abuse, especially if that abuse has come from members of, of religious organizations. And in particular, the Roman Catholic Church, in the case of the um, Italy Universal Periodic Review, because the Catholic Church has such a privileged position within society and also legally in, in Italy. Well, what's been the Italian government's response so far? We haven't had any direct, um, as far as I know, any direct response from the Italian government. Um, and so this is the issue sometimes with putting the, making these statements at the UN level. I've often, I think, gotten feedback from other NGOs and from people who are specifically interested in these issues. But from the actual governments themselves, they have a tendency to reply and just say, well, um, and not directly to, to, to the NSS statements, but to, just to civil society statements and say, well, we, we'll take them on board. Thank you for them. We value the, the input from civil society, but they won't specifically address them. So we, would, we hope that it will at least interest some people within the Italian government or, or, or some legislators who are working around child protection and in particular child abuse. Um, so that is, in a way, it's, it's, it's a question of being activists within that space and, and raising awareness and then never giving up in that so that when the time is right, maybe some other um, political interests align and we're able to, to see some kind of difference. Um, so your aim is to put um, long-term pressure on, on the Italian government, basically, until yes, something happens yes. and, and on the church. And there is also um, within the, the Universal Periodic Review, because there's a specific report that is published, what we had been urging is for that report to have um, to include um, the need for what we're, we're calling for mandatory reporting. So essentially the idea is that if you're in a position of responsibility and you hear of, uh, or are aware of um, abuse of children going on or of a child, you then have a legal duty to report that abuse um, to the authorities. And those authorities have to be the state authorities rather than, for example, the Catholic Church authorities. And that's something which is not currently... No, and it's not currently... Well, it's there, Yep. Um, so our aim in a way is to sort of show that there is a lot of gaps still in the protection um, around children. You met mentioned the possibility of linking up with other organisations. Mm -hmm. Has that happened so far on this issue? On child abuse, um, I think so. I know that um, Heath Portius Wood, who's um, the president of the NSS, has worked quite a lot with other organisations. So for example, um, organisations for survivors of abuse. He's also worked very closely with um, researchers in Australia who have created a, a compendium um, of uh, essentially an analysis of child abuse, um, both in Australia and abroad, and who've um, provided um, ways in which it, it can be addressed. Um, so we've also worked with um, an organisation called Mandates Now, which um, develops the mandatory reporting framework and made sure that this, these kinds of, um, of organisations are also on the radar of, um, of the people to whom we're, for example, submitting written statements. So whether it's within the UN Human Rights Framework or within the UN Committee, of the Rights, Committee on the Rights of the Child, we would then seek to um, highlight what other organisations are doing because they will essentially be the experts in these fields to, to help provide um, solutions or frameworks to be able to address the issue. So it's a collective effort, basically. Yes, it is, yes, yeah. And let's move on to a topic which is particularly close to home, which is caste discrimination. Now, you said before that you can use your representation of the UN to put pressure on the UK government. Um, how have you been doing that in, in the caste discrimination case? So we, um, in, in 2012, I uh, 
gave a, t a statement on caste discrimination um, at the Human Rights Council. And what then happened with that is that we, um, I think it was Keith, was, so Keith Porteous, our president, was able to lobby uh, MPs and also members of the House of Lords in London and then put, and as um, they were putting in um, changes to um, the Equality Act to try to say, well, actually, caste should be a protected characteristic. And so what's happened is that we have been able to get that, be, so essentially make, ensure that it is considered by members of the House of Lords as bills are being tabled. However, um, so just to say, being able to say that this issue is an issue that is being considered at the UN and is being raised at the UN also puts pressure on Parliament and on members of the House of Lords and on politicians within the UK because the UN obviously has uh, has clout and has uh, and, and is relevant to, to the way that the UK wants to position itself. So we, we want to be able to, to show that any sort of human rights um, difficulties that are being encountered in the UK are not going to just be a domestic issue, but they're actually going to be highlighted at the UN. And, this, and, and, um, and for me specifically, I think it's quite important that we don't always position ourselves, for example, in the UK and in other Western countries as saying that we value human rights, but then not ensure that our own domestic human rights record is essentially as clean as, as it can be. How, how big is uh, an issue is caste discrimination in the UK? I think it's a, it is a big, a really big issue, but not one that is um, very easy to quantify. So the difficulty is that there was a report that was provided, um, so drawn up by a previous um, UK government, um, I think this was around 2016, um, perhaps a bit before, and they saw that um, the, it, it was really difficult to get people within um, communities that would that would um, enforce a caste system or still have a caste system to then report on it to the authorities or to sociologists who might be um, carrying out a qualitative or, or even quantitative analysis. And so um, what this um, report found was that um, caste discrimination was having an impact on a huge variety of um, of areas of society. So, for example, it had impacts on employment. So, it, it could, which means that there could have been, or it seems to be, caste discrimination when people seek employment. There is also issues around um, care, elderly care. So, you, if if you are, for example, from a lower caste, um, uh, or so-called lower caste you might not then get the right kind of elderly care from providers who would give caste some kind of regard. Um, so there is essentially a, a huge variety. And that, that's sort of from from societal perspective. Um, these are examples that treat with, with sort of organized parts of society. But there is also a, a huge untold impact when it comes to mental um, well-being. So when it, when it comes to issues around depression and social isolation as well. Oh, why, why has the UK government so far failed to make um, caste discrimination a protected characteristic under the Equality Act? I think what we've seen is a difficulty to get politicians to take the issue seriously in a sense that they um, analyse it from a, a, an objective perspective. And what we've instead seemed to be seeing is that politicians um, obtain information from community leaders that are essentially have a louder voice um, or a closer connection to politicians and these community leaders are often those that have maybe more um, ex extreme views so for example that might promote um, caste, uh, a caste-based system and therefore there is a, a difficulty with MPs having to ensure that they're keeping the support of their communities and being fearful of alienating parts of, the com of, of their constituency um, and therefore not willing to um, address issues which might be seen to be questions of cultural differences rather than actual human rights violations. How do you see your um, work at the um, UN, mm. uh, your, your representations at the UN on this issue, um, putting further pressure on the UK government? Do you think it's likely that the government is going to change its stance at any time in the near future? So we... Um, what does happen when you give a statement at the UN is that um, ideally the representative, the delegation, let's say from the UK government, will be taking note of the statement that has been given and then um, will be reporting it back to um, the, I guess, the, the Foreign Office. 
And so what then happens from that is that these kinds of issues are then logged and hopefully the human rights work, lawyers or, or, or human rights specialised people within the UK government would then bring that issue back to, let's say, the prime minister or to specific parts of government. That's obviously the ideal situation. But of course, the question is whether these issues are actually politically expedient and not for the government to take into account. And so also the, the fact that as, for example, as lobby, lobbyists for the NSS, we're able to then take the fact that this issue was brought up at the UN back to MPs when we then do our own political lobbying um, in Parliament and our own uh, when we send our own sort of um, reports to various people within government that we might know. And so we're able to also put this other tangential pressure that's not just relying on the UK delegation bringing the information back to the government, but us, us also saying, well, this is a, an issue that has been raised. Um, and we've done, we, in the past, we've raised the issue of, of caste discrimination in 2012, but we've also raised it again in 2016 and now this year. Um, and this provides continuity with a problem that's able to show that it's not being met with any kind of um, action on behalf of the UK government. And it's coupled with the fact that this, the issue of caste discrimination was also brought up in the universal periodic review that the UK was undergoing. So there is a specific requirement from the UN to the UK, which is binding in terms of international law, that is saying, well, actually, the UK should change its legal framework work so that um, caste is a protected characteristic under the Equality Act. So as a matter of international law, um, the UK is, is now obliged to, is that what you're saying? Yes, yes, exactly. And beyond that, the Committee on um, on Racism, um, from w- which is also a subcommittee within the UN um, structure, has also reminded in 2016 the, the UK that they were under this obligation to essentially put, in, put this pr- protection into law. How, how does the UK's lack of specific law on caste discrimination compare with other countries? I'm not um, exactly certain as to whether other countries have brought it in um, specifically, so I wouldn't be able to, to speak on that spe- um, per se. What is interesting, though, with the UK is that from a legal perspective, the UK government has been saying that it is fine for it to not to legislate specifically to change the law, because the UK government seems to believe essentially that um, there they can still be a change in the law via case law rather than via legislation. Is, is that um, adequate or inadequate in your view? No, which is completely inadequate because case law is, it does not provide any kind of certainty that, that a protection will be put in place for people who are victims of caste discrimination. Instead, case law... Um, would only develop if somebody brings a case that is then successful and that then sets a precedent that says that people who are subject to caste discrimination should be protected. However, it's extremely unlikely that somebody who suffers from caste discrimination would have both the funds but also feel comfortable enough to be able to bring such a discrimination suit um, in the courts because often that means going, let's say, against their employer or speaking out about an issue that is very specific to one part of their community, especially if for them that community is probably all that they really see um, in their daily life. And we've seen similar issues when it comes to things like female genital mutilation. There is a parallel in a way between um, these kinds of um, of human rights violations that are seen as being cultural um, norms and therefore not something that government should actually be engaging with. But actually, all that this does is mean that government is failing in its protection of its own citizens. So there is a real advantage in these some so-called culturally sensitive matters to actually make it clear what the law is yes. so that yes. people then feel confident about protecting themselves by bringing exactly. that suit. Exactly. And just one final question, Josephine. How is the coronavirus pandemic affecting the UN's work on human rights at the moment um, that you've seen so far? And how like, how is it going to affect it, do you think, in the near future? Um, so we, the, the Human Rights Council in um, the, this time round was running between February and March. And actually, the first two weeks went ahead and the last week was cancelled. Um, I was quite surprised that it even went ahead because... Um, at the time, the Swiss government had said that gatherings of a thousand people should not be um, taking place. 
And I'm not exactly sure how many people gather in Geneva for the Human Rights Council, but I'm sure it's at least around a thousand coming from all over the world. And we're all generally milling about in the same building and often within the same large um, auditorium. So I think it was, to me, quite surprising that they hadn't yet put things in place um, to deal with it. But beyond that, I think for the, they ended up being, finding solutions, for example, by saying that we could only have a set number of people in a room and separating everyone. And so in line with lots of other industries and, and other um, international organizations, um, there, there's going to be obviously a rise in online work and trying to address issues that way. Um, there is the difficulty that... I think quite a lot of the lobbying that, can, that happens at the UN happens during um, side, of, side events that are essentially held in parallel to the main program of the Human Rights Council. And also it happens a lot in um, the main cafe, um, funnily enough, of, in the UN building. And so um, not having that one um, reunion of many people who are physically all in the same place and all focused on the same kinds of issues, it will probably make... Um, quite a big difference. But I mean, the question is whether they um, end up hosting it or not in, in June, and then also in September. So it's all uncertain at the moment, basically. It's all, it's all, it's all um, quite uncertain, as far as I know. But that's, that's interesting to hear that it's about personal connections as much as anything, rather than just the formal events. And um, it is quite strange, because I, I delivered a statement um, several years ago on slavery in Mauritania. And um, when I was delivering the statement at the end, the Mauritanian representative um, obviously spoke to address the whole council during his right of reply and said that there was no slavery in Mauritania. But then I ended up being able to have like off the record conversations with him about the issue when we were in the cafe. And, and he'd come up to me specifically to talk to me about, about this issue afterwards. And, and because that whole environment is meant to be of the record and the low lobbying is meant to, to, to take place in the main auditorium. There is that ability um, to, to have these connections, which you wouldn't be able to have if you're in an, as far as I know, if you're on an online system. Strangely enough as well, um, there's another example from when I was I delivered a statement on um, a video that the Innocence of Muslim uh, Muslims video that was published in 2012, I think it was. Um, yeah, it was in September and it, and it surfaced and caused a huge number of riots and of attacks also on the, it was linked to the attacks on the US embassies in, um, I think in Egypt, but then also in Benghazi um, when the US di diplomat was killed. And for example, when I spoke on that statement, we, we, I was trying to make the point that actually it was not because something as horrid as that video was surfacing, that it was okay to start implementing principles and also laws in various countries that would allow for censorship of criticisms of religion, even if that criticism is, is offensive. And um, at the time, because the US was in such a, a delicate situation because of the, uh, of the um, demonstrations and violence that was happening in Egypt and also in Libya, um, Obama, who was president at the time, was um, leaning towards saying that censorship was justified in circumstances of statements that were offensive to different religions. And in parallel to me giving that statement, there was a, a resolution that was being passed around uh, on essentially on blasphemy at the UN, and it was being pushed a lot by that by the OIC, and um, and it was starting to receive support from Western countries as well. And interestingly, just after I gave that statement, a change was made being, that was pushed, I think, by, I think by the potentially the UK and the US to the resolution. And um, again, we're able to—I was able to know about this because we had our team on the ground in um, in Geneva, and somebody was able to get a copy of a, a photocopy of the resolution with a markup by hand that said that there should not be censorship simply because the offensive statements were being made that caused religious offense, offense to religious um, people. And um, that evening, which would have been sort of the noon for the, for the US, Obama then addressed the General Assembly in um, New York and, and changed his discourse at that point and actually said, there is no essentially no right not to be offended. Obviously, we can say that it is extremely offensive to have 
videos like The Innocence of Muslims out and, and it should not be um, given any kind of notice. But it doesn't mean that freedom of, of expression should be curtailed. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 being, and having that presence at the UN and, having, and being able to develop personal relationships, which comes from being able to go and have coffees with people and, and being there on the ground, um, helps a lot for that kind of um, situation. So it's really important that the NSS should keep having representatives at the UN. I mean, really, uh, really important. And it's hard work. I mean, I, I, I was lucky to have some time off now between two jobs to be able to de dedicate to coming to um, Geneva. And um, logistically, it's always a bit complicated, but it is something that is really important um, to do um, and to keep doing, um, even if sometimes it feels like we're shouting into the ether. Well, Josephine McIntosh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks very much, Emma. That was episode 23 of the National Secular Society podcast, hosted by Emma Park. If you would like to help us challenge unfair religious privilege and support freedom of and from religion in Britain today, why not become a member of the NSS? Full details are on our website at secularism.org.uk forward slash podcast. If you like this podcast, you can find more episodes and more information about this episode on the website. Thanks for listening.